is session number three entitled The Herd of Healing. And as I said, whereas the issues that we look at in sessions one or two are more heretical from a doctrinal standpoint, nothing is more harmful to people from a practical and a pastoral standpoint than what the faith preachers teach about divine physical healing. This touches all of us. We either need healing ourselves or we have a loved one who does. There are some things I want us to consider, some points to ponder, if you'd like to alliterate it a little bit. Just kind of in a general nature, dealing with miracles and healing. Number one, large numbers are not necessarily indicative of God's blessing or approval. This movement is large and it is growing, but just because it's growing does not necessarily mean that God is the source of that growth. That's far too simplistic logic. If that were sound logic, then we would have to say God is giving his blessing and approval to Islam because Islam is the fastest growing religion in the United States of America. So just because a movement or a church, for that matter, is growing does not necessarily mean that God is the source of that growth. False prophets are not going to look like false prophets. The Bible tells us that Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. As a wolf in sheep's clothing. Dear friends, Satan is not going to show up to us red and scaly with a bifurcated tail carrying a hay fork. He's smarter than that. He's going to disguise himself as an angel of light. He will have some truth, but he will mix in with that truth, error and heresy, to corrupt the whole thing. And the Bible tells us that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The ability to do miracles is not necessarily a sign that God is the source. The faith preachers say, well, we have this inordinate emphasis on miracles because miracles are what prove that the gospel of Jesus is true and all other religions are false. Uh, this is also faulty logic. Consider this video clip from Benny Hinn. If the gospel doesn't have, if the gospel lacks if the preaching of the gospel lacks signs and wonders, it's an empty shell. If the preaching of the gospel lacks signs and wonders, it's an empty shell. Friends, that is heresy. What does the Apostle Paul say? Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also to the Greek. What is the power of God? The gospel is, as it is read and as it is preached from God's word. I do believe in miracles, but miracles do not have the power in and of themselves to convict men of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The gospel of Christ does. When I was a little boy, I prayed for my healing because I wanted to walk. You know, I wanted to be able to play football do all those things that I thought were so important. As I entered into my early adult life, though, I still prayed for my healing, but I can honestly tell you my motives changed. I no longer, longer prayed for my healing just so that I could walk. I prayed for my healing because all I could think about is what a powerful testimony that would be. If all of a sudden I were to show up walking, you know, there is no cure for cerebral palsy. Once you got it, you got it, unless God does something. So if I were to just show up one day walking, there would be no other explanation for my healing other than God. And I could just see myself going, you know, I'm getting into visualization stuff here, but I could just see myself going into, you know, going all across the country and packing out big old coliseums and, and just having multitudes of people come to know Christ because of the great demonstration of God's power in my life. But then I came to a text of scripture that really, once I understood it, it really it, it totally changed my thinking on this. And that text was Luke chapter 16. You'll remember with me the account that Jesus gave of the rich man and Lazarus, both of whom died. And I do believe this was a real event in history. I don't think this is just a parable. This really happened. But the rich man and Lazarus both died. The rich man went to the place of torment, Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom, and by the way, the rich man did not go to the place of torment because he was rich. Lazarus did not go to Abraham's bosom because he was poor. Each man went where he was spiritually prepared to go. But 
to paraphrase this story, both men died. The rich man woke up in the place of torment, and he apparently could see across this great chasm Abraham and Lazarus there beside him in his bosom. And he, he looked across, and he said, he cried out. He said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my five brothers and warn them not to come to this place. And what did Abraham say? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Moses and the prophets had been dead for centuries. How could they possibly hear Moses and the prophets? This is how. And what did the rich man say? He said, no, Father Abraham, but if somebody were to go back from the dead, then they'll believe. Abraham said, if they will not hear Moses, if they will not hear the prophets, neither will they believe, even if somebody were to come back from the dead. Dear friends, I do believe in miracles. The greatest miracle of all is that of salvation. But there is an inherent power in God's word that is not even found in miracles. God could turn me into Olympic, an Olympic gold medal winning gymnast right now. But if people will not hear Moses, if they will not hear the prophets, neither will they respond even if God were to do that. The power to convict men and to save men is in the Word of God, in the Word of God alone. The ability to do miracles is not necessarily a sign that God is the source. Jesus' own words. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Jesus is very clear that there will be many on that day. And they'll say, Lord, we prophesied in your name. In your name we cast out demons. We perform many miracles, all in your name. Jesus said, I never knew you. Depart from me. What a terrifying passage of Scripture. Dear friends, just because somebody has the apparent ability to perform a sign and wonder does not necessarily mean that that ability is coming from God. Let us remember that when Moses and Aaron were before the Egyptian court, Aaron cast down his staff on the floor and it became a serpent. Apparently, the Egyptian magicians could do the very same thing. They even turned the Nile River into blood. There is an ability to counterfeit miracles. Satan does have that power. Now, Satan's power is limited. He's on a leash. And God's holding the other end of that leash. But he does have power to counterfeit signs and wonders. Now let's get into the meat of the matter. Physical healing. Is it always God's will? The faith preachers say, yes it is. Benny Hinn says, he promises to heal all, everyone, any whatsoever, everything, all our diseases. That means not even a headache, sinus problem, not even a toothache, nothing. No sickness should come your way. God heals all your diseases. The faith preachers make no bones about it. We should never be sick. Or in the unlikely event we do get sick, physical healing is guaranteed as long as we have enough faith. This from Fred Price. When I first got saved, they didn't tell me I could do anything. They just, what they told me to do is that whenever I prayed, I should always say the will of the Lord be done. Now, doesn't that sound humble? It does. Sounds like humility. It's really stupidity. I mean, you know, you, you, you really, we, we insult God. I mean, we really do insult our Heavenly Father. We do. We, we, we really insult Him without Him realizing it. If you have to say that, if it be thy will or thy will be done, if you have to say that, then you're calling God a fool. Never mind that Jesus himself in the garden prayed, Father, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thine be done. You see the incredible arrogance of the faith preachers. This from Rod Parsley, pastor in Columbus, Ohio. Rod Parsley writes in his book, Calvary's Double Cure, the deceiving spirit of the Antichrist that contends that sin is okay is the same spirit that generates the lie that maybe God will heal sometime. The devil has stolen the doctrinal truth of divine healing out of the body of Christ. 
So if you are here to this, this afternoon and you, like me, are someone who believes that it is sometimes God's will for a person to be physically healed, then you and I have the spirit of the Antichrist. I appreciate that, Rod. This from Gloria Copeland. You could take that one psalm right there and you could do away with the tradition that says, Lord, if it be thy will, heal him. Don't even bother to pray for me if you're going to pray that. If you don't know enough about the Word of God to know it's God's will to heal, you can't pray the prayer of faith, and so you might as well just stay home. So if you believe it's sometimes God's will for a person to be healed, maybe not all the time, you can't even pray. You may as well just stay home. Unreal. Dear friends, if you begin with the premise that healing is guaranteed and a person prays for that healing for days, weeks, months, years, sometimes decades, and the healing does not come, then the question must be asked, whose fault is it? By definition, it cannot be God's fault because he's perfect. The only other one then to whom to look is the one who's sick. It's his fault or her fault because he doesn't have enough faith, has unconfessed sin in his or her life, hasn't given enough money to the ministry, or maybe you're not even saved. And lest you think I overstate their case, this from her husband, Kenneth Copeland. Well, I don't understand why God healed them and he won't heal me. Could it be? <laughs> By some stretch of the imagination, Oh, probably not, but could it be <laughs> that is your fault, not God's? <laughs> oh, yeah. Say it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lest there be any doubt as to their position. Again, friends, if you begin with the premise that healing is guaranteed, and you pray for that healing, but it never comes, you can wordsmith it all day long, you can pontificate on it till the cows come home, but the fault always lies squarely at the foot of the sick believer. There's no other conclusion which can be drawn. Is there any scriptural support, any proof text, if you will, to which the faith preachers would appeal to substantiate their teaching that physical healing is always God's will? Well, there are a few verses that they would appeal to, and I'd like us to look at a few of these. One of these, amazingly enough, is Ephesians 5.23. This is what Benny Hinn writes about this verse. Benny Hinn says, And now the Bible says in Ephesians 5.23 that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the body. He is not only the Savior of the soul, He is the Savior of the body. Ladies and gentlemen, you can cry out, You are the Savior of my body, Lord Jesus. You are the Savior of my soul. If Jesus Christ is the Savior of the body, then your body ought to be made whole. Sounds logical, doesn't it? It does. That is, until you actually read Ephesians 5.23. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. One need not be a Greek scholar to know that the body in Ephesians 5.23 is not talking about your flesh and blood body. It's talking about the church. And this kind of Mickey Mouse hermeneutics, this kind of Mickey Mouse Bible interpretation would be laughable comical if it weren't that it were leading so very many people astray. Benny Hinn ought to be embarrassed by that. Another one of their proof texts is 3 John 2. This is one of their favorites. This is almost like their gold standard. Beloved, I pray that in all you may prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. 3 John 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you might prosper in every way and that your body might keep well, even as I know your soul prospers and keeps well. Now that's a very wonderful scripture. I pray that you would prosper in every way. So he talks about prosperity. He says, I would that you prosper and be in health and be in health. So we see right there that God wants us to be healthy. Can everybody say, God wants me to be healthy? 
I'm going to say something that may at first sound a bit odd. Please bear with me. It is possible to over-spiritualize parts of the Bible. Okay? It's, it's possible to over-spiritualize parts of the Bible. And to take, take 3 John 2 as a blanket promise for guaranteed healing and guaranteed wealth is over-spiritualizing this verse. Basically, John is writing a letter to his friend Gaius. And John opens his letter in much the same way that you and I might open a letter that we write to one of our friends today. Basically, John's saying this, Dear Gaius, I hope that this finds you doing well. Friends, that's all in the world he's saying. This is just a common greeting to a letter. This is not a statement of theology. This is not a doctrinal statement. It's just agreeing to a letter. And the faith preachers know it, or they should know it. But they don't want you to know it, because it happens to fit their theology. Foundational to the faith preacher's teaching that physical healing is guaranteed is their teaching that healing is provided for in the atonement. The atonement, of course, is that word which we give to the work that Jesus did for us on the cross. Sadly, we've seen how the faith preachers put that not on the cross, but in hell. We've already dealt with that. But they would all appeal to Isaiah 53, 4, and 5, which says this, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And the faith preachers will take this messianic passage, which um, they appeal to, and they'll look at these two words that I have highlighted here, griefs and sorrows, and they'll say that another way to render these two words is as sickness and pain, respectively. And you know what? They're right. They're right. Like many words in Hebrew, these two words have multiple possible renderings. So how do you know which rendering is correct? You know which rendering is correct by the context of the passage. And I'd like us to look at the context of the passage. It comes, becomes very clear in the very next verse. Verse 5, Isaiah continues and it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Very clearly, the context of Isaiah 53 is not physical healing. It's spiritual healing. Healing from sin, not healing from sickness and disease. We see that from these two words, transgressions and iniquities. Yet how many times have you heard Benny Hinn or one of these other prosperity preachers say, by his stripes you are healed, so you ought to be physically healed. No, the context is not physical healing, it is spiritual healing, healing from sin. And another way we can know that is we can ask the question, did any of the New Testament writers appeal to Isaiah 53? And indeed they did. Peter appeals to it when he writes, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, not in his soul in hell, by the way, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his stripes you were healed. Very clearly, Peter cites Isaiah 53 in the context of spiritual healing. Healing from sin, not sickness and disease. Now, I do want to be intellectually honest and tell you that there is one New Testament writer that appeals to Isaiah 53 apparently in the context of physical healing. Matthew does so in Matthew chapter 8 when he records Jesus' healing of Peter's mother-in-law. And Matthew says that it was done in order that what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, He himself took our infirmities and carried our diseases. Now, Matthew does apparently cite Isaiah 53 in the context of physical healing. So, uh, what are we to do with this? Well, it's very important to let Scripture interpret Scripture. When Jesus came to this earth, his primary mission was not to heal people of their sickness and disease. His primary mission was to make atonement for their sins. And so everything that Jesus did always has to be viewed in the broader context of him making provision for people's sins. Everything that he did was related to that, whether it was turning the water into wine or walking on the water or raising the dead. It was always in the broader context of making provision for their sin. Even when he healed people, it was to make a statement about his mission of forgiving people of their sins. And we can see that illustrated in the very next chapter, Matthew chapter 9, when Jesus healed the man who was paralyzed. And he said, 
but in order that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on, on earth to do what? To forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Rise, take up your bed, and go home. Did you know that there was never a single time when Jesus healed anyone just so that that person could have an easier life? Jesus never healed anybody just so that that person could be more comfortable. Jesus always healed with the broader context, the broader view in mind of making a statement about who he was and what he was primarily about. And that was forgiving people of their sins. He said, but in order that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins, rise, take up your bed, and go home. So, what is the answer to our question? Is physical healing provided for in the atonement? I might surprise you with my answer. Yes. Yes, it is. In the grand scheme of things, the reason I have cerebral palsy is a result of sin. Not my personal sin, but the sin of Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, and by the way, we don't know it was an apple. Could have been an apricot for all we know. But when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit, when they sinned, they disobeyed God, not only did sin enter the world, so did sickness and disease. It's one of the consequences of living in a fallen world. The reason many of you today are wearing eyeglasses, that's a result of sin. Not your personal sin, but the sin of Adam and Eve. Next time you catch a cold, you can blame Adam and Eve for that. It's just one of the consequences of living in a fallen world. So when Jesus came and died on the cross, he paid for our sins. He also paid for all of the consequences of those sins, one of which is sickness and disease. So, yes, our healing has been provided for in the atonement. But here's where the faith preachers get it very wrong. Not all of the benefits of the atonement are promised to be fully realized this side of heaven. Not all the benefits of the atonement are promised to be fully realized this side of heaven. Some of the benefits of Jesus' atonement are not promised to be realized until the other side of heaven. And healing from sickness and disease is one of those benefits. Uh, to give you another illustration, um, a glorified body is also provided for in the atonement. And no offense to anybody here, but I don't see anybody here today walking around with their glorified bodies. I've known a few people vain enough to think they have their glorified bodies, but I promise you they don't. It's provided for in the atonement, but not promised to be realized here. When I die and I go to heaven, I'm not taking my crutches with me. I'm not going to need them. Because my healing has been provided for in the atonement. But to be real honest with you, when I die and I go to heaven and I'm in the presence of God, I'm not sure it's even going to cross my mind that I can walk. I'm not sure it's even going to dawn on me that I no longer have my crutches because I'm going to have better things to think about. I am going to be in perfect worship of, fellowship with, and service to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I'm not sure it's even going to cross my mind that all of a sudden I can walk. I have better things to think about. Praise be His name. Praise be His name. So dear friend, take heart. Your healing has been provided for. But you may not realize it here. Don't worry. You will over there. What of the biblical record? Can we look through the Bible and find examples of people who loved the Lord and served Him faithfully yet did not walk in perfect health? Absolutely. Trophimus was left sick at Miletus. Epaphroditus was sick to the point of death. The Apostle Paul encouraged Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach in his frequent ailments. Now I find this one particularly interesting because the Apostle Paul and Timothy were traveling companions. And if Paul could heal people at will, just like you turn on and off the light switch, I find it very interesting that he somehow saw need to tell Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach in his frequent ailments. Job. Job is the theological elephant sitting in the living room of the faith preachers. 
none of whom want to admit is there. Job's a problem for the prosperity gospel. Because here you have a man who was upright and righteous, hadn't done anything wrong, and yet God still allowed Satan to come and strike from Job everything that he had. His family, his possessions, and ultimately his own health. Job's a problem for the faith preachers, and they know it. And so they have to get around old Job, and the way they'll do it is they'll say, well, all of these things that befell Job, you see, those were all the results of his negative confessions. Job spoke negative things, and because of those negative confessions, all these calamities came upon Job. Poor old Job, it was all his fault. The Apostle Paul himself suffered from a thorn in the flesh. Let's look at this. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 and 9. The Apostle Paul says, And lest I should be exalted above measure because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. What revelations are these? The revelations that the Apostle Paul spoke of in verses 2 through 4, where he said that he was caught up to the third heaven but heard inexpressible words that man is not permitted to speak. Those revelations. For this reason there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this thorn, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. The Apostle Paul had some kind of thorn in the flesh. Um, what was that thorn? We don't know. Scholars have been debating about the identity of this thorn for centuries. In fact, the matter is we just don't know what it was. I do believe it was something physical. Now, the prosperity preachers would say, no, that was just symbolic of those people who opposed him in his ministry, symbolic of his persecution. And that, I will say that idea has some merit. I won't discount it totally. But I'll share with you why I don't think it's the right view. Uh, number one, the Apostle Paul said it was a thorn in the sarks, the Greek word for flesh. And number two, when was it that the Apostle Paul seemed to thrive? When was it that he seemed to be at the top of his game? It was when he was being persecuted. Paul wrote some of his best stuff sitting in a prison cell. So I would think it would be quite uncharacteristic of Paul to all of a sudden pray for the removal of the very thing upon which he seemed to thrive. So um, I don't think that that's right, the right view. But, you know, playing devil's advocate, if this is not convincing enough for the faith preachers, and of course the faith preachers said we should always be wealthy and, you know, always be blessed, so whatever the identity of the thorn is, it still goes against their theology. But um, if they don't think that was something physical, then I would say, okay, flip over to Galatians chapter 4. When Paul writes, but you know that it was because of a bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. And that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel of God, as Christ Jesus himself. Paul writes that he definitely had a bodily illness. And look at how the Galatians responded to him. Oh, that the faith preachers had the same gracious attitude toward the afflicted believer as did the Galatians towards the apostle Paul. Elisha had a double portion anointing of the great prophet Elijah, yet we read in 2 Kings 13 that Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. Dear friends, it's a matter of biblical record that not everyone who loved the Lord and served him faithfully walked in perfect divine health. It's not a matter of opinion. It's not up for debate. It's just a matter of biblical record. If it is always God's will to be healed, according to the faith preachers, are there any requirements to receive this healing? Yes. Faith preachers say there are requirements, and one of these requirements is that you must have a sense of expectation. You have to believe that your miracle is on its way. You have to believe, Lord, I know you're going to heal me. It is your will to do it. I'm expecting it. I'm ready to receive it. Have at it. Watch the following video clips, and watch how very good the faith preachers are at whipping people up into emotional frenzies where in their, when they're in a state of expecting the miraculous to come, that it's just around the corner. Of God, I the power of God to make me sound, make me sound whole, whole delivered, delivered, saved, saved healed, healed now, now. It is
is the will of God, will of God for, me to be healed, for me to be healed and to live a long life. And, long life. and, I and say, Lord Jesus, just speak the word. One more time. Again. Say it again. Say, Lord Jesus, just speak the word and I will be healed. Amen. I want you just to lift your hands and say, Holy Spirit, I welcome you with all of my heart. I welcome you right now. see how very good the faith preachers are at whipping people up into these emotional frenzies when they're expecting the miraculous and it's only then that miracles ever seem to take place have you ever wondered why it is that if God is really healing the sick through Benny Hinn Todd Bentley some of these others why are they not in the hospitals you know I went to see Benny Hinn in Memphis Tennessee a few years ago why didn't he almost literally cross the street and, and go to see go to St. Jude and heal some of those sick kids with cancer, some of them dying? Why didn't he do that? The reason the faith preachers don't go to the hospitals is because they can't control the atmosphere in the hospitals. You see, miracles only seem to happen in a closed environment with dimmed lights, rhythmic music, rhythmic chanting when people are worked up into emotional frenzies, then and only then do miracles ever seem to take place. The very first Benny Hinn crusade I attended was in Birmingham, Alabama in March of 2002. I was sitting next to an elderly woman who was in a wheelchair. She had an oxygen tank strapped to the back of her chair and she had oxygen tubes up her nose. And I was talking with her daughter. Her daughter told me that her mother had severe emphysema and had been unable to walk without her oxygen for the last two years. Couldn't even take a step without her oxygen. And after Benny Hinn preached for a while, then it came time to take up the love offering. And the love offering was, is always collected just before the healing starts, by design. And so once these buckets start going around, everybody knows what's coming next. And boy, you could just feel the excitement. I mean, there was just a buzz. And people knew what was coming. And I looked over, and this dear lady took the tube out of her nose, flipped it over the back of her head. She stood up out of her wheelchair, began to walk around. She said, I'm healed, I'm healed. Hadn't done this in two years. Some Benny Hinn staffers ran over to her and they said, ma'am, tell us about your condition. She told them. She said, I'm healed. And they said, well, ma'am, do you want to go on stage and meet Pastor Benny? Yes, yes. So they began walking with her down to the front. And I just stayed where I was and I just watched. And the further she walked, the slower she got. And she finally had to stop. And she motioned to her daughter. Her daughter rushed back, got the wheelchair, and then rushed it back up, put it behind her mother, and her mother just collapsed in the wheelchair, absolutely exhausted. Temporary emotional euphoria had subsided to physical reality. And that's the vast majority of cases of people claiming to be healed at Benny Hinn Crusades. If you'll notice, you'll never see anybody get up on stage in a Benny Hinn crusade that looks like me. Because I have a, a disability that can't be hidden. I can't do anything. You know, all these people that claim to be healed, they have some kind of illness that cannot be readily seen. Ringing in the ears, bad back, fibromyalgia, something very common.
cure, quote unquote, healed at Benny Hinn Crusades. If God is really healing the sick through Benny Hinn, we should expect to see amputees grow new limbs. We should expect to see the severely mentally retarded restored. But we don't. You never see anything like that. It's always somebody with an illness that cannot be readily seen. To the best of my knowledge, there has never been a single airtight case of anyone ever being healed at a Benny Hinn crusade, to the best of my knowledge. That having been said, however, I do not discount the possibility. Because let's play a little numbers game here. At any given Benny Hinn crusade, you've got about 20,000 people gathered. Let's just say 10% of those folks are there to be healed. And I'm sure the percentage is a lot higher than that. I've been to these meetings, but let's just say 10%. 2,000 people sick. Many of these folks love the Lord. And friends, just because someone follows a Benny Hinn or a Kenneth Copeland or one of these others doesn't mean they're a bad person. I mean, they, a lot of these folks love the Lord. They're just being led astray by wolves in sheep's clothing. But they're all praying to be healed. Believing as I do that God does still heal people today, I would expect some of these folks to be healed. Not because of Benny Hinn, but in spite of Benny Hinn. And what speaks such volumes to me is that there apparently are none. You figure at least 2,000 people every month, month after month after month for, for 20 years? Do the math. That's a lot of folks. And not one documented case? It's almost like God is going out of his way not to heal people at Benny Hinn Crusades. And if somebody were to come up to me and, who's sick and they tell me they're, they're thinking about going to Benny Hinn Crusade, my advice to, to them would say, no, don't do that. Don't go to Benny Hinn Crusade because your chances of getting healed are going to go down. It's almost like God's going out of his way not to. But could it have happened? Sure. I just haven't seen any evidence of it. Must have a sense of expectation. Another requirement to receive your healing from God, according to the faith preachers, show me the money. Today, you should give your biggest uh, cash bill or write your biggest check and send it in and then expect God to give to you. You can't out. Hallelujah. A thousand dollar vow of faith, big deal. We got people on welfare that's got enough faith to make a thousand dollar vow and paying it. And paying it. Heavy that he's into, he prophesies and he told me how he did. He sat right, I mean, he looked right across the table back and forth at me and, and, and he told me how, you know, how he confiscates money. He says he's on this station, it's over 40 states, and, uh, He'll go on there and he'll be, get on the radio and he'll say, I know that listening to my little voice tonight, that there's some lady out there and you've got $10 put away in a cookie jar. Now God spoke to my heart and told me to go and tell you to get that $10 and get it in the mail and send it to me and God will bless you. God will give you a reward such as you've never known before. And then he comes back to me and tells me, he says, if you're on the radio and you're going over 40 states, and you're on at prime time, you've got thousands of people listening, the chances are that there are at least two or three hundred little old ladies who've got a ten dollar bill in a cookie jar. And so if you even get, you know, if a couple hundred go over and get it and send it to you, that's two grand that you've made just like that. And so, you know, if you're going to get into big time religion, this is the games you've got to play, things like that. It's a, it's a, you go into it as a business and you work it as a business, you know. Saints, this is why we need to give to the gospel now more than ever. You know, Naima said, well, I gave last year. Forget it, last year it's gone. That cycle is over with. Seed time harvest of last year is gone. Every season is a fresh season. Amen. We are in a fresh season. What, what you gave last year will not reap you anything this year. What you gave even a few months ago is gone. You got the harvest for that. When I talked with Dr. Roberts today and we talked about this seed faith thing, he said something awesome. He said, the Bible says giving and receiving, but he said, God has taught me by studying that word receiving that another way to say that word is receipting. The word receiving means receipting. And so he said, when you give, you get a receipt. 
in heaven that when you have a need, you can then go with your receipt and say, you see, God, I have got my receipt from my sowing, and now I have a need, and I'm cashing in my receipt. I get asked a lot about Joyce Meyer, and that clip should be enough in and of itself to give anyone serious pause as they follow this woman's ministry. Joyce Meyer gets up and she says, another way to say the word receiving is receipting. Paul Crouch said, just before she said this, Paul Crouch said, we're not telling you that you can buy a miracle. Oh, really? Well, what do you call it, Mr. Crouch? When Joyce Meyer gets up there and says, another way to say the word receiving is receipting, and when you have a need, you give to God, you give to TBN that's sitting on cash reserves of over $300 million or more. And when you sow your seed, God will give you a receipt. So when you have a need, you go before God and you say, Here, God, here's my receipt. I'm cashing in my receipt. If that's not buying a miracle, then what is it? And stop and think about how many millions of people around the world watching that night and they're sick or they have a sick child and so they go to their checkbook and they write out a check for an amount of money they probably cannot afford because remember if you give it's got to be sacrificial because if you don't give sacrificially God's not going to honor that so you give sacrificially and then you send it in to these multi-millionaires thinking that God's going to cash in your receipt. One day, these false teachers will have to stand before a holy God and give an account for what they are doing to God's people. But precious people just keep calling. And the Lord God is going to bless you beyond your expectations. Get ready. Specific. And then, send a gift Here's why. The Word of God says give, and then the promise says, and it shall be given. The Word says sow, and then you shall reap. You can expect a harvest unless you've sown a seed. See? You can expect a miracle till you've acted in faith towards that miracle coming your way. So send that seed today, whatever amount. And really, it depends on your need. Someone came to me in church recently and said, Well, Pastor, <laughs> how much should I give to God? I said, what kind, of har what kind of harvest are you looking for? How much should I give to God? Well, what kind of harvest are you looking for? The not-so-subtle insinuation is, is that if you have cancer, or maybe you have a sick, dying child, you had best dig deeply. Because the bigger miracle you need the bigger monetary seed, you better sow. One day, these false teachers will have to stand before a holy God and give an account for what they are doing to God's people. The following rather astonishing admission from Gloria Copeland. Brother Hagin's always taught us that healing is the dinner bell. <laughs> healing is the dinner bell. <laughs> healing is the dinner bell. I was really surprised when I heard Glory Copeland be so frank and honest. Healing is the dinner bell. Have you ever wondered how it is that these prosperity preachers can pack out 20, 30,000 seat coliseums night after night after night? Have you ever wondered how it is that they have such huge and devoted followings? You think people are flocking to these prosperity preachers to hear the gospel of repentance preached? No. Healing is the dinner bell. The faith preachers appeal to two of the most basic and universal of all human desires. Nobody enjoys being sick. And so they flock to these preachers, not to serve the master, but to feast on what they are being told is on the master's table. Healing is the dinner bell. That's what gets people coming. You know, 
I couldn't pack out a 30,000 seat coliseum night after night after night. And Pastor Bob, I know you're a wonderful pastor, wonderful preacher, no offense, but neither could you. Because the gospel that your pastor and I preach doesn't promise people that if they'll come and give to our ministries that God will make them wealthy and heal their bodies. There's not a great deal of money to be made in the true gospel if it's preached right. But there's a ton of money to be made in this gospel. Healing is the dinner bell. I want us to take a brief excursion from the norm and I want you to listen to an audio clip from a preacher that I actually very much admire and respect, the late Dr. Adrian Rogers. Now, I believe that God heals, and I want to make that abundantly clear. I believe that God heals people supernaturally. But, friend, that cannot and should not be the focus of any ministry. If I had the power, and I am not a healer, but if I had the power to bring somebody down here in a wheelchair paraplegic, lay hands on that person, and that person would be instantaneously, miraculously, supernaturally healed, the word would get out in this city next Sunday, you couldn't put people in here with a shoehorn. They would be here, mister. And I mean, if I began to do that, there would be people coming down here in great numbers. I mean, if it were real, if it were authenticated, they would be all over this place. Touch me, heal me, touch me, heal me. But you preach Jesus, preach salvation, preach repentance, preach being broken. Oh, no. Preach power, give me this power. As usual, Dr. Rogers is spot on target as usual. If it's always God's will to be healed, are there any other requirements to receive your healing? Yes. According to the faith preachers, another requirement is you must have a right heart and you must persevere. Your heart must be right with God and you must persevere in your search for a miracle. This is what Benny Hinn told the Miracle Crusade audience in which I was in attendance in Birmingham, Alabama. Benny Hinn said, you cannot receive healing unless your heart is right with God. Healing is easily attained when your walk with God is right. Now stop and think just for a moment. Put yourself in the shoes of someone who is there and who is sick with cancer or in a wheelchair or with a sick child. And when the show is over, they leave with the same cancer, they leave in the same wheelchair, they leave with the same sick child. Now not only do they have their illness with which to deal, now they also have to worry about their own spiritual deficiencies. That there's something wrong with their walk with the Lord just because they're sick. Just because they're sick. In light of a statement like this, that healing is so easily attained when your walk with God is right, have you ever wondered if Benny Hinn ever gets sick? Interesting question, is it not? Well, I found a couple of clips and maybe he can shed some light on this for us. Believe me, when, believe me when I tell you, I never get sick. Crying, Do you know what, rejoicing. You know what happened to me one day, I'm going to tell you. I was as sick as a sick dog. With a, with a cold. Yeah, yeah, I get sick too. Well, that clears that up. <laughs> this from Gloria Copeland. So it's easy to be healed. And you can receive your healing anytime you're ready. Any of you can receive healing today anytime you're ready. You don't have to wait till the end of the service. You just take it and go with it. Glory to God. You can receive healing anytime you're ready for it. I find that statement very interesting, especially in light of the following email, which I received from her husband, Kenneth Copeland, just about three months after Gloria Copeland said this. Kenneth Copeland sent out an email to his followers, and he, this is what he said. He said, much to my deep regret, I must postpone our meetings in Australia, Singapore, Korea, and Hawaii. A few days ago, I injured my back badly enough that even though my healing has already started, so many hours of flying would just be too much. Let's face it, I let this situation in my back go on too long. Now, wait a minute, Kenneth. Your wife just said you could receive healing anytime you're ready for it. And yet, Kenneth Copeland had to postpone three international and one domestic crusade because of his bad back. I wish ill on no one, not even Kenneth Copeland. 
But I do find it interesting that what the faith preachers preach doesn't seem to work for them. And if what the faith preachers preach doesn't work for them, that ought to be a clue to them. There just might be something wrong with what they're preaching. Why are they sick? Essek W. Kenyon, the grandfather of this movement, died from a tumor. Kenneth Hagin, father of the modern Word of Faith movement, died from heart disease. Oral Roberts wears eyeglasses, has heart problems, and poor health. Fred Price's wife, recently treated for cancer. Jan Crouch, recently had cancer, gallbladder surgery. And Nora Lamb, the faith healer that I went to see as a teenager, had a massive stroke in 2003, died early the next year. Friends, the faith healers get sick just like us common folk do. And if what they're preaching doesn't work for them, that ought to be a clue to them. There just might be something wrong with what they're preaching. This is an interesting photograph that I came across. Jesse Duplantis, Benny Hinn, and John Hagee. Now, let me say something about John Hagee. I get asked a lot about him, too. I don't necessarily put John Hagee in the same word of faith camp as Benny Hinn and Copeland and Duplantis and the others. I, I agree with a lot of what John Hagee preaches. I do. I disagree with a good bit of what he preaches, too. He preaches prosperity, guaranteed healing, uh, has some rather unorthodox views of salvation of Jews and things like that. But I uh, don't necessarily call him more to faith. But he regularly associates with them. The thing that really troubles me is the people with whom he associates. He regularly associates with Benny Hinn, Kenneth Copeland, and he regularly has Jesse Duplantis come and preach for him in his pulpit. Jesse Duplantis is one of the worst of them. And as a pastor, who you have fill your pulpit says something about who you are and what you believe. And so I want to be fair to John Hagee, but I just offer you that bit of caution. But the real reason I want to show you this picture is not that John Hagee's in it. That's neither here nor there. I want you to look at the man in the middle, Benny Hinn. What's he got on his face? Oh, eyeglasses. Mr. Miracle himself has to wear eyeglasses. Physician heal thyself comes to mind. I wonder what's wrong with his walk with the Lord. You must have a right heart and you must persevere. This is what Benny Hinn wrote in his book, The Miracle of Healing. I remember a lady who went to Catherine Kuhlman's meetings 11 times before she was healed. 11 times. I asked one day, why did you keep coming back? She said, because I knew. I knew my day was coming and I was going to go back until God healed me. I was not giving up. The reason many do not get healed is because they give up so quickly. I attended a Benny Hinn crusade in Dallas, Texas, June of 2002. And I was sitting next to a man who was in a wheelchair. At the time, he was 32 years of age, in a wheelchair. His, all four of his limbs had to be strapped down because of extreme spasticity in his muscles and ligaments. Even his head had to be strapped back to the headrest behind him to hold his head up. He was wearing a bib because he's constantly drooling on himself. His eyes were rolled back in their sockets. And I was talking with his mother who was there with him. And uh, his mother told me that her son had the mind of an infant. He was a vegetable. And just in casual conversation, I asked her where they were from. She said, New Hampshire. Friends, we were in Dallas. I said, ma'am, did you drive your son all the way down here from New Hampshire to see Benny Hinn? She said, oh, yes. We follow Benny Hinn all over the country. Can you imagine what that poor woman must go through lugging her incapacitated son, who was bigger than she was, all over the country, hoping this will be the time, this will be the time, this will be the time, and it never is. Oh, it's no skin off Benny Hinn's back. No, he just takes their love offering, and he goes home to his $10 million parsonage overlooking the Pacific Ocean and leaves all these poor people behind to pick up the shattered pieces of their lives. One day, these false teachers will have to stand before a holy God 
and give an account for what they are doing to God's people. If it is always God's will to be healed and your healing does not come, are there reasons for that? Yes. According to word faith theology, nothing will make you lose your miracle of healing more quickly than your lack of faith. You must have enough faith. This from Benny Hinn, and it might surprise you. You know, isn't it, when it, it's so cruel to tell people, well, you're sick because you have no faith. That's so cruel. Yes. No, no, it's not, it's not our faith. It's his mercy. Yes. It's his grace. Isn't that right? Yes. You know what? He's right. He's absolutely right. But unfortunately, that is not, uh, that is not typical of what he preaches. In fact, not at all. The following is more like what he really teaches. My friend, hear this well. The reason people lose their healing is because they begin questioning if God really did it. We receive it by faith. We keep it by faith. Say by faith. Hind and touched his garment. Now, before she touched, verse 1 to 8 says, For she said, For she said, For she said, Say that with me. In other words, she knew. She knew that she knew that she knew she's going to get a miracle. First key, she heard. Second key, she came. Third key, she knew. When you know, you're on the way. But if you sit there and say, I'm not sure, you just lost it. What does laying your hands on a human have to do with healing? Well, really nothing. We touch people all the time, they're still sick. What he's looking for is permission. Absolutely. The power to heal is always present. But having permission to heal is held up by humanity and their lack of faith. <laughs> Hallelujah. Having permission to heal is held up by humanity and their lack of faith. Is faith required for us to receive healing from God? Well, it's not a very easy question to answer because there is at least one occasion in which, in which Jesus appeared to be hindered from what he wanted to do for people because of their lack of faith. However, there are other occasions in which Jesus healed people and there's apparently no faith at all required on the part of the person being healed. The man born blind in John chapter 9, Jesus healed him, but that man didn't have faith in Jesus, didn't even know who he was. Gerizim demoniac, Mark chapter 5. Jesus healed him, but that man didn't have faith in Christ. He was demon-possessed. So it's not a very easy question to answer, but if faith is required for us to receive healing from God, I think the question that needs to be asked is this. What kind of faith is required? Now, the faith preachers say you have to have the kind of faith that says, God, I know that it is your will to heal me. I know you're going to do it. I'm ready to receive it. I'm expecting it. Have at it. Is that the kind of faith for which Jesus asked? It doesn't appear to be, at least not in the context of physical healing. Let's look at Matthew chapter 9. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. When he entered the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done unto you. Notice the question that our Savior asked these men. Did he say, Do you believe that I will do this? No. He said, Do you believe I'm able to do this? Literally in the Greek, Jesus said, Do you believe I have enough dunamis? Do you believe I have enough power to do this? They said, Yes. And then he said, According to your faith, according to that kind of faith, be it done unto you. Dear friend, I, I have all the faith in the world that Jesus is able to heal me of my cerebral palsy. He created me. He can heal me. Jesus would not break a sweat healing me of my CP. But to save me, he had to die. Dear friend, if you are here today, 
and you know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you've been born again. Don't let anybody tell you that you don't have enough faith to be healed. If you've got enough faith to be saved, you have certainly got enough faith to be healed. If Jesus were to heal me right now of my CP, and I were to drop my crutches and leap off of this stage, be completely whole, never to pick my crutches up again, that would be a pretty incredible miracle. Who knows, maybe even make the papers. But as incredible a miracle as that would be, dear friends, that miracle would pale in comparison to what God did for me when he saved me from my sins. That is the greatest miracle of all. If you've got enough faith to be saved, rejoice, my brother. Rejoice, my sister in Christ. You have certainly got enough faith to be healed. And don't let anybody tell you anything different. According to the faith preachers, are you not healed? Well, maybe you're not even saved. This is what Benny Hinn said on TBN. He said, when Israel came out of Egypt, God performed an incredible miracle, and that is when he healed all of Israel. The Israelites were all healed when they ate the Passover. When people are saved, they ought to be healed at the same time. The Bible says when he brought them out. The reason so many are not healed, they're not out yet. They're not saved. This from Benny Hinn. Now, ladies and gentlemen, hear this very clearly, please, and never forget. It's as easy to get healed as it is to get forgiven. It's as easy to receive physical healing as it is to receive forgiveness for sin. It's just as easy to get healed. Healing is as easy as salvation. Do not complicate what is simple. Say with me, it's as easy to get healed as it is to get forgiven. Healing should never be separate from salvation. Healing should never be separate from salvation. I invite you again to stop and think and put yourself in the shoes of someone who's there, who's sick, with cancer, in a wheelchair, with a sick child. And when the show is over, they leave with the same cancer, the same wheelchair, the same sick child. Now not only do they have their illness with which to deal, now they have to worry that they're not even saved. Friends, I've been to the Benny Hinn Crusades. I've been to eight of them. And I've seen what the television cameras won't show you, that on the floor in the back are dozens and dozens and dozens of sick people in wheelchairs. I've seen people lying on the floor so sick with cancer they cannot even lift their heads. I've seen people on stretchers. I've seen parents cradling vegetative children in their arms, dying babies in their arms, tubes coming out of these precious little babies' noses, mouths, tears streaming down their faces, praying that God would heal their child. And then they hear a statement like that from that false prophet. Now not only do they have their illness with which to deal, now they have to worry they're not even saved. Friends, sometimes a man or woman has good reason to doubt his or her salvation. If there's never been a change in your life, if you don't hate sin, if you don't love the Lord, love the Word, if you don't love the brethren, those are good reasons to doubt your salvation. But being sick is not one of them. Being sick is not one of them. The faith preachers take the Word of God, and instead of it serving as a source of strength and encouragement to the afflicted believer, they take God's Word, they wrench it out of its context, Turn it on its head so now it stands in judgment over them. And I cannot imagine a more self-serving perversion of God's word than what the faith preachers do with it. And to top it all off, they take their money.
We have one final video clip today, and I want to set this clip up for you a little bit before I show it. This clip is going to begin with a few short, assort, assorted clips of Gloria Copeland. And then the clip is going to move to a man named Garwin Dobbins. Garwin Dobbins is one of the most beautiful examples of anyone I've ever seen uh, who suffers from a disease the likes of which I dare say no one in this room, including myself, could even begin to imagine. And through unimaginable suffering, he loves the Lord and serves him faithfully. And I want you to notice the contrast between a wolf in sheep's clothing and a real man of God. That's a tradition that God is glorified when you're sick. Well now, if you'll just think about it a minute, it would be very difficult for God to be glorified through you when you're sick. It is nonsense to say that sickness and disease works for good. It's a slander to talk evil about God. When he is totally good to say that it's God's will for you to be sick or he's the one that made you sick, that is pitiful. Or he's doing that to teach you something you don't hear those things as much as you used to, I don't guess. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't go where you could hear them, so I don't know. You probably, they're still out there, I imagine. But if it was true that you learned through pain and suffering, we could just knock every little kid in the head before he went to school every morning <laughs> and see how he did that day. He'd come dragging in, his eyes rolling around, and, well, tell me what you learned today. I didn't learn anything. My head just hurt me all day long. That's about how stupid that is. So that God puts, here's, here's the doctrine that, that, uh, that people get hung up on. God gets glory from sickness and disease. Now that is, that just sounds so ridiculous to me now. I've heard the truth for so long. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose. So traditional doctrine takes that, verse 28, doesn't look what's around it or what's behind it, and they say, well, you know, you know, all things work together for good. Here you've just had a car wreck, your leg's broken, your head's all bandaged up, and somebody comes on with the, in with the comforting words, you know all things work together for those that love God. And you say, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I should have thought of that. <laughs> Does that make any sense at all? No. It is not Bible that God gets glory from your sickness and disease. And one of them is a gentleman named Garwin Dobbins. And he's here. Would you all welcome Garwin right here? Garwin, Dobbins. Garwin, we love you. And this season wouldn't be appropriate for us to tell of the goodness of the Lord if, if you weren't here helping us. Garwin, I want you to talk right then, Mike. Tell us. Let me see if I can get this disease right because it's big, long, a lot of vowels and consonants. Myositis mm -hmm. esophagans yes. progressiva. Right. Did got I get all that right? You got it. There's only how many people in the world ever had this? As of right now, there's supposed to be 350 known cases. All right. Tell us what this disease actually does just in a short amount of time, what it does to the person. It makes your muscle turn to bone. And it, uh, when it starts, it feels like Two different people is twisting the inner core of your bone and uh, putting it over an open flame. You know what's a, a, what I admire about you so much is with this debilitating disease that you have is your spirit. You have the spirit of a champion. And in this uh, autumn time of Thanksgiving, is it possible to have something like this in your life and yet remain thankful? Oh, yes. Tell us, how, how are you thankful in times like these? I'm very thankful for, for life, for health, for eyes. When I see <clears throat> that there's people that's worse off than myself, there's people that don't have legs, that don't have ears, 
don't have a healthy mind or cannot have a sense of smell. And when I look about and see the color that God has spangled the sky with and the, and the rainbow, and when he put the stars in the sky, I know that he cares for me. Yeah. Now you sing a song that we're going to do right now. If the Lord doesn't choose to heal you on this earth, there will be a time shortly when you will be healed. In your mind, what do you see yourself doing when this body has been exchanged for your new body? What do you see yourself doing? We're going to run on the streets of gold. And uh, number one person I want to meet is David because he has been a strength to me over the years and uh, I want to be as close to him like him in praise and worship wow isn't that incredible that he would uh, you know a lot of people might be bitter or angry at God and yet he remains a person of praise there's never been anybody I've ever met that is more encouraging than Garwin. Garwin, you sing a song called I Can Only Imagine. Mm -hmm. Can we help you? Yes. But you just want to do this by yourself? No, I want you to. Okay, all right. Let's, uh, let's uh, stand you up here. Undo his, undo his seat belt. Watch for the airbags and all the... Here we go. I can only imagine. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. I can only imagine I can only imagine When that day comes When I find myself Standing in the sun I can only imagine When all I will do Is forever Forever worship I can only imagine I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel Will I dance for you Jesus Or in all To my need will I fall, will I sing hallelujah, will I be able to speak at all, no me imagine this, I can only imagine. Surrounded by your glory, what 
will my heart feel Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in love you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? not Bible that God gets glory from your sickness and disease. Healing should never be separate from salvation. I can only imagine I can only imagine Only imagine Garwin no longer has to imagine. He's gone on to be with the Lord. Faith made sight. The Apostle Paul writes. Concerning this thorn, I entreated the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Praise be his name. Praise be his name. Dear friend, if you are here today in you have a sickness or disease or you have a loved one who does my first word of encouragement to you would be that you go to the Lord you go to his throne of grace and ask him to heal you and I will pray with you that he does but if he doesn't know that sometimes there is something better than being physically healed and that is knowing his sufficient grace that is knowing his strength made perfect in our weaknesses. Praise be his name. As we conclude today, I want to ask you this question. Do you know the one who gives his sufficient grace? Do you know the one who gives his strength made perfect in weakness? Friends, do you know the one who has made provision for your sin? Has there ever been a time in your life when you have been convicted by God's Holy Spirit that you are a sinner, that you have broken the laws of God. You've lied. You've stolen something. You've looked with lust and committed adultery in your heart. You've used the Lord's name in vain, committed blasphemy. Has there ever been a time when you've been convicted by God's Holy Spirit through His Word that you've broken God's laws? And because you have broken the laws of God, God's wrath abides on you. Has there ever been a time in your life, dear one, when you have been convicted by God's Holy Spirit of the truth of the gospel, that Jesus was pre-existent with the Father, that he came to this earth fully God and yet fully man, and lived a sinless, perfect life on this earth, and willingly laid down his life on the cross and bore the wrath of God so that you and I don't have to. Have you been convicted in your heart of the truth that Jesus on the third day was raised from the dead and one day is coming again? Dear friend, I'm not asking you if you are a member of this church or some other church. I'm not asking you if you've walked the aisle. I'm not asking you if you've been baptized. I'm not asking you if you've prayed the sinner's prayer, which isn't found in Scripture. I'm asking you, have you ever been convicted of sins? Have you ever repented of your sins and placed all of your trust in the risen Lord Jesus, in Him alone, for His salvation? 
Dear friends, that is the greatest healing of all. Knowing Christ as Savior and Lord. Let us close in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise you. We thank you for your sufficient grace. We thank you for your strength made perfect in our weaknesses. We thank you that you have made provision for our sins, that you came and you bore the wrath of God on, on that cross so that we won't have to. Father, I pray that if there is anyone here today or maybe someone listening to me through video later, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would convict them of the truth of your word, that convict them of their sin, convict them of your wrath, righteousness, judgment, but also, Lord, that you would convict them of your love for them, that you would convict them of the truth of the gospel, that they will turn from their sins and place all of their faith and trust in you. You'll save them. The wrath of God will be removed. And we'll have all of eternity to live in perfect fellowship with you. These things we ask and pray in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen.